Shinto shrines, or Jinja, are places of worship and the dwellings of the Kami, the Shinto gods. Sacred objects of worship that represent the Kami are stored in the innermost chamber of the shrine, where they cannot usually be seen by anybody. In some cases, a mountain, waterfall, or rock behind the shrine can be the object of worship. People visit shrines in order to pay respect to the Kami, or to pray for good fortune. Shrines are also visited during special events, such as New Year's and festivals. Newborn babies are traditionally brought to shrines a few weeks after their birth, and many couples hold their wedding ceremonies there. These are areas deep-rooted in Japanese history. Therefore, the shrine grounds make for a perfect setting for some scary stories. One night, I decided to visit a local shrine with a few friends. It has a reputation for being haunted in our town. One of my friends said that she had the ability to sense the presence of spirits, and I really wanted to bring her along to see if she picked up on any creepy vibes. She agreed to come along, and we were off. The shrine was close to a huge pond. During the day, it's a tourist spot, but at night, ghost hunters have been known to flock to the location, and that's exactly what we were there to do. I think the location itself makes it creepier. Shrines are so old and unique. In order to get to the shrine, you have to walk down a narrow, dark road. The floor is littered with uneven stones, and it's difficult to get your footing right. After that, you approach a huge Tory gate, and from that point, you enter the shrine. There are no light sources there, and natural light is scarce, as it is obscured by the trees surrounding the shrine. One of the famous rumors about the shrine is that even during summer, you can get the chills just from being there. Chills which indicate that you are in the presence of spirits. That night, we headed down the uneven road, through the trees, and we arrived at the Tory Gate. As soon as my friend who could sense spirits walked beneath that gate, she froze. She said that she felt sick. She managed to mutter, There are so many of them. We would better get out of here fast. I shone my torch her way, and her face was ghostly white. She began to cower, literally shake with fear. I guess that she must have been feeling faint. Another friend looked at me and then scooped her up in his arms and began to carry her back to the car. We got back in the car and even though it was summer, the car felt freezing cold. I went to start the engine, but it just spluttered. I tried again and nothing. I heard a weak voice coming from the back seat say, they're coming, we need to get out of here, now. The car finally started but when I pressed my foot down on the accelerator, the car only just began to crawl forward. No matter how hard I pressed down on the accelerator, the speed didn't increase. It was like we were stuck in thick mud or something. It was only when my car had crawled about 10 meters away or so that I was able to speed up and gain some form of control back over my vehicle. We pulled over at a convenience store to get my friend a cold drink as she was still half in shock. When I returned to the car, I saw something. There were handprints all over the back of my car, on the glass, on the trunk. They were everywhere. Small handprints, big handprints. They weren't there before. Seeing that sent chills racing down my spine. And I've stopped messing around with haunted spots since that night. Ushinokoku Maeri is one of the most famous and dreaded rituals from Japan. 
It takes place between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. This time period is known as the Hour of the Ox. This is the period of darkest night, when the border between the world of the living and the world of the dead is weakest. During this time period, evil spirits are in their greatest power. If you intend on carrying out this ritual, then you'll need to prepare the following. White clothing. Imagine the kind of attire you saw Sadako wear in the ring. That would be preferable. Crisp white shrine clothes. However, if that's unavailable, then white clothing will do. A straw doll. An effigy constructed from straw. A hammer. As many long nails as required. And a small amount of the target's hair, blood, fingernails, or failing that, a photo of the target, or a piece of paper with the target's name on. Once you have all these things ready, it's time to get your white clothes on. Cover your face in thick white powder, and you can even make your lips bright red too. An upturned trivet is then placed atop your head. And on that trivet are three candles. This will serve as your makeshift flashlight. Now that the lengthy preparations have been completed, it's time to sneak into a shrine between 1am and 3am, because this ritual needs one final thing, a sacred tree. Approach the tree with the nails in your mouth. You may have seen this image in popular Japanese horror media. I'm thinking, he told Junji. Once there, you will find a tree in a secluded area. It is said that facing northwest yields the greatest results for the curse, and once the tree has been selected, nail the straw doll against the tree. I should say that the doll should be filled with either the blood, hair, nails, or photo or paper with the target's name. Hammer the doll with all the malice and hatred you have in your heart for the intended target. Once the ritual has begun, it cannot be stopped for seven straight nights, so you better remember which tree you picked. Also be careful of getting caught. You could be arrested for committing this act of trespassing on shrine grounds after hours. It has to be done in complete secrecy. It's not like the shrine owners are going to give you permission. There is one other thing I should mention about getting caught. If there are any witnesses to your curse, then you must kill them. If you don't, then the curse will curse the caster instead of the target. As the old saying goes, those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Simply put, those who curse others are pretty much going to hell. The risk is great. The act of Ushinokoku Mairi isn't exactly illegal, but if you admit to the police that you intended to curse someone, then you can be charged with intimidation and potentially arrested. Another important thing is the placement of the nails. Basically, where the nails go into the doll are the areas you want to inflict pain. Like Kokuri-san, I believe that the effects of Ushino Kokumairi are created by evoking spirits during the hour they are closest to our Earth. Some who have carried out this act have cited that the placebo effect comes into it a little. For example, imagine your target was your boss and you hammered the nail in his straw effigy's stomach. Then at work, you saw him going to the bathroom often, or complaining of a stomachache, or maybe calling in sick. Then perhaps you might think the curse is working. It could, however, be just a coincidence. But hey, if you hate someone enough, maybe this is the curse for you. I'll leave you with this parting image of a straw effigy found in a shrine this year, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Next up, we have a story about this curse, so I hope that I have adequately explained some of the points here. When I was younger, one of my close friends lived nearby a pretty big shrine. We used to dare one another back in those days, and one night we ended up testing our courage by heading into the shrine late at night. My friend and I knew the layout of the shrine pretty well, so we decided to hide within the shrine grounds to try and freak out our friends who would walk through in pairs. 
We headed in at around 1am to wait for our friends. I was talking with my friend in there, trying to decide where the best places to hide would be. After about 15 minutes, far too long, we saw a flickering light approach. Here we go, I thought to myself. When I was getting ready to do my creepiest voice, I noticed something that didn't seem right. My friends were supposed to be coming in groups of two, but as the light drew closer, I noticed that it looked like it was just the one person approaching. I smiled to myself because I thought, wow, one of my friends is really trying to show off his masculinity here. I planned on jumping out at him to see how tough he really was. <laughs> but when the light got closer, I noticed that the silhouette belonged to a woman. I could see her long flowing hair. Now it was just us boys out at the shrine that night, so this was naturally pretty alarming to see. The woman was wearing a white t-shirt and slacks or chinos. She was holding a small pen light in her hand. I looked over at my friend in the dark and saw him hiding. I guess that was the best thing we could do. Hide. I held my breath as she passed us. I didn't want to get caught trespassing. She was about five or six meters away from us, and she took something out of her bag and started hitting it against the tree. In that moment, I knew exactly why she was here and what she was doing. She was cursing someone through the Ushinokokumairi ritual. It was silent in the shrine apart from the sound of that straw doll rustling. And between the sound of the hammer hitting the nail, I heard the woman muttering, Die! 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 It was scary as hell. I was dripping with sweat. I thought stuff like this didn't happen in the real world. Then I realized something. Soon my friends would walk through here, and they won't know that the woman is in here. You know what they say about this ritual, if someone witnesses the cursor during the act, they have to kill the witness. I don't know if that's just an urban legend, but there's a woman out here alone at 1am with a hammer, performing the ritual, and I was taking zero risks. I was worried about my friend's safety, so I dug my phone out of my pocket, and I tried my best to keep the bright screen hidden by aiming it at the ground. I typed out a message to my friend group in as few a words as possible. Don't come. And I hit send. I wanted to get the hell out of there as soon as possible. I gestured to my friend who was in the shrine with me. I pointed at the exit. I'm actually really grateful for the moonlight that night. My friend nodded to me and I was bracing myself for a quick exit. I knew that if he started running, then so would I. Just in that moment, something happened. My cell phone began to ring. I had completely forgotten to set the damn thing on silent mode. Naturally, when you send a message to your friend group like the one I did, you would expect them to make a call or reply of some sort. I should have muted the phone. I should have even turned it off. So there my friend and I were in the dark in an almost empty shrine with my ringtone blaring out. It sounded so loud in the dead of night. I took a quick glance over at the woman. She turned around to face us in shock, and that was it. My friend and I started sprinting. We ran a few hundred meters and we didn't hear any footfall following us. I turned back to check, and the woman wasn't chasing us. We kept going until we got all the way back to my friend's house. We messaged our friends group and had the others come meet us there. At first my friends thought that it was just a prank or a joke we were trying to play on them. But when they saw our faces and how shaken up we probably looked, then I think the reality of the situation sunk in. We decided to abandon our night of dares. It was a real shame for the guys because we had been planning this for ages at school. We really were looking forward to it. We were left with an underwhelming atmosphere in our group. We really didn't know what to do with ourselves. Well, that was until one of my friends came out with this idea. Hey, when it gets a little brighter, let's go back to the shrine and see if we can find the straw doll. All of my friends jumped on this. They loved that idea. I looked at my friend who was in the shrine with me and I could tell he was thinking the same thoughts as me. Hell no. We were more than reluctant, but in the end, we were persuaded by the momentum of our friends. We left my friend's house after a few hours. We were all there for a sleepover. 
The morning light had illuminated the area. I couldn't forget that woman and how hate-filled and angry she sounded. I was scared to go back, I can't lie. My friends who hadn't experienced what we did were racing up ahead already entering the shrine grounds. My friends urged us to show them the tree we saw her hammering the nails into the straw doll, and we obliged. When I found the tree, I noticed that there were a few nails sticking out of the bark, but there was no straw effigy. I wondered if the woman quit halfway through the ritual, or if someone who tended the shrine saw it and cleared it away. My friends were all complaining about the situation. They wanted to see something more. I was fine with it, as it was. Relieved, actually. We stood there for a while, chatting, and I noticed that my friend, who was in the shrine with me, had fallen silent. His face looked a little pale, too. He was seemingly fixed on some spot just over my shoulder, and naturally I turned to look at what he was looking at. He was looking towards a car, which was parked just outside of the shrine grounds. My eyes locked with the glare of the woman we had seen earlier that night. I let out an involuntary kind of gasp. It was loud enough to concern my friends. It's her, it's her, I said. Everyone spun around to face the car. We stood there like statues staring at the woman. The car then started and slowly pulled away. All the while, the woman stared at us. Needless to say, we ran for it. To be honest, this is where my experience ends. I never saw that woman again, but I was so worried that I would run into her, and she would exact her revenge on me witnessing her ritual. I'll never forget the horror I felt when I turned to see her staring at me and my friends that morning. The feeling of being watched is pretty much my biggest fear these days. And to think that she'd curse someone and want them to die. There was a mean streak in that woman I can't quite adequately express to you, but I'm so glad we got away from her. When I was younger, there was a small shrine close to my elementary school, and I remember that I played there often. Although small, it had a main building, and a little garden-like area. Beyond the garden was a forest that always seemed to me like it endlessly stretched onwards. The forest seemed massive, but that might have been down to the fact that I was a little kid, and everything seems bigger when you're a child. In front of the shrine's main hall was where we played. There was this big open space and it felt like it was ours. There was a small candy shop near the shrine too, so all us neighborhood kids would hang out at the shrine with our sweets. There were about six or seven of us in our group. I remember going there to play hide and seek often. It was great. When I got into junior high school, I stopped playing there so much. I got busy with all my club activities. I didn't have the time to hang out with that friend group much. One day after school I ran into one of my close friends from those days, and I walked home with him. He agreed that life had got a lot busier since we were growing up and we reminisced on the good old days. We were talking about the time we played a game of tag or tag depending where you're from. While we were on this subject, I discovered that our memories of those days differed. We seemed to disagree on the number of friends in our group. I seemed to remember a boy, but my friend didn't. We chatted about it and it went something like this. Hey, aren't you forgetting someone? There were more than six in our group. What about the boy with the very fair skin and those big eyes? To this, my friend would adamantly reply, What do you want about? There was only six of us. I don't remember this kid. So that was strange because I remembered the kid clearly. I decided to check in with some of my friends the next day at school because I wanted to get this discrepancy sorted out. I asked two other friends and they could remember playing together at the shrine, but once again, they had no recollection of the kid with the fair skin that I remembered. It was starting to get a little creepy at this point. I remember that kid so clearly, so how is it possible that none of my friends do? 
Are they all trying to trick me for some reason? Or is there something at work there at the shrine? In my city, there's a spot of land, and no matter what kind of store starts up there, they always go out of business. This is just my personal experience, but I've seen countless businesses fail there. As of today, the land is a vacant lot. The locals say that there is a history to that area. Apparently, it was the site of public executions centuries ago. Since those days, the land has been developed. Many homes, many stores were created. The population of my city seems to grow with each passing year. It's changed a lot since I was a kid. Because the population of our city grew with each coming year, it stands to reason that businesses would flourish. However, that one plot of land was like salted earth. Nothing grew there. If memory serves, then the first business that started up there that I can remember is a home improvement store. And when that went out of business, a drugstore replaced it. Then I think a clothing shop which specialized in jeans, and shortly after that one was a failed cell phone retailer. It's not just business failures. I mean, every city has those. But there has been countless accidents on that site. Mainly traffic accidents. A lot of them. And to be honest, a lot of the locals throw caution your way if you even mention that area. They say that there's something wrong there. Rumor has it that there was a shrine close by to that spot, but it burned down. Maybe 400 meters away. It was strange because, apparently, if it had been a windier day, then the whole village back then could have been engulfed in flames. It would have been a catastrophe. Usually, shrines are constructed solely of wood. They're elegant buildings which are irreplaceable. It's always sad to lose part of history to something like this, and it's the way with our shrines. Once the most sacred and innermost part of the shrine has been destroyed, i.e. by a fire, there is no going back. It's kind of hard to explain. But the innermost part of the shrine is generally the part that houses the spirit, or the kami, that people come to pray or worship. In this case, the main part of the shrine wasn't destroyed there. After the fire, a portion of the shrine was rebuilt with reinforced concrete. Curiously, the remaining unburned part of the shrine was walled off, and to this day, it is still walled off. Barbed wire surrounds it. It's a shame because I imagine that shrine was a thing of beauty, but now the concrete, walled off block stands overlooking the town as a gloomy monument. Some object that reminds us of constant destruction, accidents, and the lack of prosperity. In that area, no flowers or business grows. That area, not 400 meters away from the shrine, was the former public execution site. It was once a forest, and in the secrecy of the forest, many lost their lives. I believe that this was the reason for the shrine's construction. The shrine was there to commemorate and respect the lives of the executed. Due to rapid economic growth, the forest was gradually cleared and developed into residential areas. I first started living in this area in the early 90s, and I still remember some of the forest still being there. Until at least the year 2000. I even remember a little urban legend in my town about the woods. They say that if you went out into the middle of the woods at night, on a full moon, you could hear the sound of the executioner's axe coming into contact with the wood block beneath the victim's head. But in the early 2000s, the forest gave way to what they call around here progress. Trees were wrenched from the ground and concrete replaced them. Now the legend in my town is that the shrine burning down and the lack of any meaningful business ventures panning out in this area is down to the fact that so many executions took place on those grounds outside the shrine. There are so many vengeful spirits remaining there. The shrine was built to calm those spirits of those who died, and that was the purpose, I believe. There are some places on this planet which have been the site of tragedy and incredible hurt and loss. 
Maybe those places should just be left as they are, and the race to progress and develop should find another route. That's just how I feel anyway. <laughs>